Welcome back, everyone, to the 8.30 to 9 a.m. session of the 2021 Open Simulator Community Conference. This session, we're pleased to introduce the presentation Future Scene Gate 2.0. Our speakers are Lisa Laxton and Frank Ruloff and several of their interns. But before we get started, I want to just remind you that you can check out our website, conference.opensimulator.org, for speaker bios and details from their sessions, like links to things that they may mention. Um, and as well as for those of you listening on our pre-recorded or our recorded session, you can ask your questions through Twitter at OpenSimCC and hashtag OSCC21. Anybody else within the world, if you could direct message me your questions, that would be fantastic. All right, I'm going to start this session, Frank. I'm going to toss it over to you so you can introduce all your great interns. Thank you, Meg. And uh, again, uh, nice to be here. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, the, the, the students that have been working hard on the future Seagate 2.0 uh, viewer. Uh, the last group that worked uh, on that was uh, Axel, Marion and Tiffen. Uh, they did the first initial work on it. And the current group that is working now are Alex, Coche, Pierre and Oscar. And they all come from the CPE in Lyon, which is a, 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 a university. Um, and they have different uh, uh, trails of uh, what they are learning to, but all in the area of, uh, of software engineering. Um, so I would like to uh, give the word to uh, Tiffen as the first that he will uh, tell more, more about what he his group did in the last uh, year. Over to you. So uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Tiffen Fabry and during this presentation I will present you the work we did with my team last year when we were intern at uh, Thales Netherlands as says Frank. We were a team of three, composed of Axel, uh, Salmon, Marion Clement and I, and we were all French students from the engineering school uh, CPE Lyon. Our mission was to upgrade uh, the rendering engine as a Senegate viewer. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Frank. Uh, so our first mission was to analyze the code of um, the Senegate Bureau in order to identify the rendering part and uh, regroup them uh, together. Uh, we decided to classify the files involved in the graphic engine according to their use. For that, we looked for the central files which manage all these functionalities and that allowed us to identify all those which were necessary to their functioning uh, afterwards. After the classification, we had to group them together in the single folder. The creation of this uh, graphic brick engine will uh, allow us uh, thereafter to facilitate uh, its removal in order to put a new one with a better performance. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see the graph, but if you in the graph, uh, as you can see in the graph, we wanted to have an independent rendering part that could be connect or disconnect with the other part, like server or the physics. Uh, next slide, please, Frank. Uh, when this step was done, we had to find a replacement for our graphic engine. Uh, this uh, new graphic engine had to have several particularities, uh, which are really important. Uh, it had to be visually more beautiful than the current one because it's an upgrade. Uh, it had to have better performance in terms of uh, frame per second, for, uh, for example, the 3D headset in the future. Uh, it had to be open source because it's uh, the key of this project. And finally, it's uh, its programming uh, language had to be a C++ in order to match the rest of the initial code of the Snagate viewer. After studying several known engines such as Unity or Unreal Engine, as we, as Frank told uh, you before, uh, our choice fell on uh, the Godot engine, 
uh, this engine met, met all our criteria in addition to have an active community and a prospect to, uh, for evolution. This part were, uh, was uh, really important for us in order to keep uh, updating the rendering engine in the future or just adding new fe features. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then uh, we had to do the same classification work we, that we had done on the Senegal Bureau. Uh, this step will uh, facilitate the association between the files having the same function uh, in the two graphic engines. So we sorted them in the same way which gave us the same table with the file of the new engine. Uh, you can see it on the presentation. Um, finally, uh, the last step consists in uh, reemplacing uh, one by one the Senegate files uh, by the uh, Godot one. We had to identify which file had the same role as the uh, old one. Uh, indeed, uh, we had grouped them in categories, but we did not know their precise errors for each one. To do this, we had to read the whole code and uh, find uh, some uh, documentation on the internet. Uh, moreover, the two engines not having exactly the same functioning, uh, certain file had the role of several old one and this uh, or and we, but we didn't manage to finish this part, but we gave all the documentation the work we did to the next team. You will meet right after me. And uh, I let my, uh, friends speak for the rest. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tiffany. You. Um, Oscar, will you take the second part? Uh, yes, uh, so next slide, uh, please. <laughs> uh, so I'll be presenting uh, this year's uh, progress. And uh, this year, there are four of us from uh, CPE working on the project, uh, including me, Oscar, uh, Alex, Gauthier, and Pierre, who are also on stage. Uh, next slide, please. So this year's uh, main goal is uh, to use Godot's rendering engine to improve the frame rate and stability of the SceneGate viewer so that we can potentially use uh, VR in the future. And to do this, we have set three goals um, that we're working towards this year. Uh, next year, next uh, slide, please. So uh, as you can see, this is a simplified structure of how we would like the new SceneGate viewer to function. And uh, so the three goals we have set are first to uh, create a transition interface as an uh, API that would convert everything that exists inside of uh, the 3D world and uh, that, that are sent uh, from the server into a, and convert them into entities uh, with the API that can be recognized and used by the Godot engine. Our second goal is the integration of Godot's rendering functionalities inside of the SceneGate viewer uh, with the creation of an uh, adapted Godot engine. And our third goal is uh, the rendering of the world uh, and uh, creating an output onto the screen for the user. Uh, next slide, please. So for our first goal of creating the transition API, our goal is to keep the changes of the Godot uh, engine to a minimum. That way we can uh, use most of its functions and also um, uh, in the future have upgrades uh, be a possibility. Uh, so we decided to create a world inside of Godot in which we would transfer all the visual elements from a uh, scene gate, such as the lightning, the objects and the terrain. And that way we can let Godot's rendering engine take care of the work um, through its uh, rendering process. Uh, next slide, please. So the way we want to do that is that the elements uh, from SceneGate are sent uh, by the server. They are then unpackaged inside of the viewer and uh, sent into the rendering. And what we want to do is intercept those uh, entities uh, before they go inside through the rendering and pass them through our API that will convert them into objects that uh, are then created inside of our Godot world. 
there are also all the updates of the camera and objects that uh, go through the API into the world. That way, er every change that happens in real time will ha also uh, happen uh, at the same time in the Godot world. Uh, as of now, uh, we've had some successful tests of creating objects sent by the server inside of the Godo world, uh, but there is still a lot more to be done on that part of the, the project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for our second goal of uh, the integration of Godot's rendering functionality, our goal is in the end to create one single application with a single executable. And uh, so we have to integrate all of Godot's useful functionalities inside of SceneGate source code. Uh, the thing is that Godot was not made to be used as a library, which is why we want to create an adapted Godot engine. Uh, and uh, to do this, we also need to understand all of Godot's architecture to get the most out of it and transfer all of the necessary rendering functionalities. There's also uh, the issue that uh, Godot uses SCONTS which is a, a compiling uh, application. We, and uh, we need to use CMake inside of Viewer. So there's also a conversion needed for that. And uh, as of now, we've prog made some progress uh, of implementing classes from Godot inside of SceneGate. Uh, and, uh, but then again, like our first goal, there's still a lot more to be done on that part. Uh, next slide, please. So for our third and final current goal, is uh, the rendering. So our goal is uh, to be able to create an output onto the screen, uh, which is a result from the Godot rendering. Uh, Godot usually renders inside of its own application, and so we need to make it render inside of the SceneGate viewer, which is why we need to create tools to make this rendering process possible. Uh, we also need to take into account that the rendering is done in multiple parts with the user interface, the heads-up display, and the 3D. And um, we want uh, Godot to, of course, take play, take um, uh, take care of the 3D part because that would um, boost the FPS by a lot. But uh, we will we'll also have to see uh, if we keep uh, some of the SceneGate functionalities for uh, the 2D components. Uh, for this uh, goal, we're still at very early stages and haven't been able to do anything conclusive. So there's still a lot more to see. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, an overview of our goals for the new SceneGate viewers rendering process. Uh, there might be some changes that come with new challenges uh, during our development later on, but uh, for now we will continue with this structure. Uh, next slide, please. So in, um, in the case that everything I've talked about until now turns out to be uh, an impossible task, we still have uh, an alternative goal that we might work uh, on at the end of the year, which is to improve and optimize the current viewer's rendering and communication with the server using Godot and uh, other means we have at our disposal. And uh, so this uh, concludes uh, our, uh, our presentation on the, the last two years uh, well, thank you very much, uh, all. You. I, I think you uh, you all did a great job. Uh, I had a question uh, to the to the first group. What did you find the most difficult in the work uh, that you have been doing? Uh, I think the lack of documentation at the beginning was uh, pretty hard, and um, maybe a. Uh, know where to start uh, we were kind of lost at the beginning yes okay and you oscar pierre and others uh, i think for us as well uh, we uh, had to spend a lot of time looking into the scene gate code at the start but we've had uh, some help uh, with due to the uh, the uh, previous interns documentation um and also uh, diving into uh, uh, the Godo engine. And um, and do you do you intend to make uh, the documentation on the viewer complete when you uh, finish? Oscar. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the uh, the question. 
do you make the design documentation so the documentation that is needed to maintain the source code and to explain it you're also making that in parallel with doing the work on the viewer isn't it uh, yes, we are, we've already made some documentation to help us with our work. And uh, when we uh, make something that works, we intend to to create a documentation for it as well. OK. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, and, and Lisa kind of answered one of them, but I wanted to just put it out here. Nick asked earlier, can you use this in a mobile format? Well, Oscar. Oscar, do you have a goal of making this so that uh, people can use it mobily? Uh, for now, no. We nope. haven't really thought about it. It's mostly uh, okay. just on PC. Well, most the most uh, to 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 answer this question a little bit more. The problem with with uh, with uh, mobile, of course, is uh, the 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 processing power of mobile phones. So if you can do the rendering somewhere else and then stream it to a mobile phone, that works fine. But if you really have to run the application on a mobile phone, mostly the, uh, the, the CPU power is not enough to do that. And uh, what we're doing now is not especially focused on, uh, on mobile phones, but to run it on a, on a, on a normal PC, laptop or, or whatever. Um, but there is a, one application, but this is a costly one, is that you run uh, these viewers in the cloud. Mm. And then you can, of course, uh, also stream it to uh, to mobile phones, uh, 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 tablets, and, and and other things. Right, but that in itself has uh, a fairly high cost to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. around sixty dollars uh, a month per CCU mm. uh, or concurrent user, and um, you know, so that if, if you look at companies like Bright Canopy, they recently shut down because they were not making enough money to fund that service and they were providing um, uh, browser access to a host of Second Life users, which is a much larger market than OpenSAM. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, along the money line, um, Alan Scott asked, Who, who's paying for this project? The, this this part of the project is paid by Thales, right. and the payment is in the form of, well, the interns they get an allowance because they do work for us, mm -hmm. and uh, my hours uh, that I uh, put into the project, as well as having a laboratory available and some support or services from other parts of the company. And mm -hmm. and the co the coordination of of this project with uh, Seengate uh, in itself and some of our other work uh, is covered on my side of the house. Ah. Okay, Gavin Hurd uh, asks, what is your strategy to decouple the rendering code from the rest of the viewer code when not even Linden Labs, who wrote the renderer, is able to do so? Well, that's one of the main uh, objectives um, of this part of the, uh, the, the development. Eventually, and we decided to first um, in first uh, take a, render, a different rendering engine in the same code. Mm. And then a next, next research step would be to look if you can take that code and isolate it in such a way with, with an API or something else or a separate, even a separate application to run it for 3D uh, headsets because 3D headsets request a constant frame rate, otherwise you get a sort of motion sickness in 3D yeah. headset. Uh, so you must allow that. And current viewers uh, are uh, not made to do that. The current viewers, there is a loop over the rendering part, but also goes over the internet to the server itself. So it means that the frame rate will, we did some, some testing in the part, we put very high performance computers uh, to to do that, but we never got it right because we also experimented with with uh, Oculus Rift and so on to see what uh, what we could uh, could achieve with that. But the frame rate we never could get on a, on a stable, and it has to do with this. So one of the things is can we uh, isolate it somehow? Um, can we isolate it somehow in such a way that we can guarantee that the rendering part will run at uh, at the 60 hertz? Uh, 
uh, frequency. And that's one of the goals that we have for the future as a next step in the uh, evolution. But first we wanted to upgrade the, um, the, the viewer with modern, uh, a modern renderer part that at the same time learns us how in uh, the Seengate viewer everything is connected. So then the next uh, step would be the research to see if you could decouple it somehow and run it and be sure that it runs at uh, 60 hertz. Okay. Um, Franz Charming asks, did you create your own documentation for the Open Simulator code that could be provided to update the Open Sim Wiki? Well, we provided documentation on the Seengate code. Ah. Because that's what we're doing now. Okay, so you, people, everyone, you can find it on the Syngate doc. Um, yeah. Follow-up question by Gavin Hurd. Um, with the very tight integration between current content and the renderer, what's your strategy to transform the content to work with a new renderer? I think um, Gautier is one of the interns that is looking at that um, at, at that uh, subject. Uh, so, Kauche, could you tell something about that? If you're not on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Kauche? Is he up here? Yeah, he's up here. Uh, yes, oh, you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I yeah, hear yeah. You. okay, sorry. Yes, uh, we, we do it uh, part by part, uh, slowly. We try to to do uh, first uh, uh, some smaller uh, objects, uh, but uh, we, we hope we're going to be able to, to do it for every kind of uh, visual element uh, at the end. So how are you doing that then? You, you look at the object, how it is being uh, rendered in the current viewer and then uh, put that against the uh, requirements for the uh, Godot engine. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, Art Blue is asking, he says, I know a bit on game engines like Unity. We moved two years ago an OAR to Unity and Google Cardboard and Oculus. I assume Godot has also a mesh-based database. Will there be a bridge from OpenSim to Godot, or am I fully wrong in my understanding? I see you speak of the rendering machine in Godot. So do you take the data from the OAR OpenSim and bring it to via Godot to the user viewer, or I'm not yes, sure if no, my question... Okay. It will, it will uh, go exactly like uh, it, it runs with the current viewer. Your objects will be uh, supplied uh, through internet in a certain form, which can be transfer, can, be, can translated by the viewer into objects you see on the screen. Now, uh, if you recall the, the, the one of the slides that has been before, now you will get the same objects, only the objects are internally converted uh, to the format that Godot knows, uh, that can handle it. So it stays internally. For the outside world, there's nothing that needs to be changed in the way the definition of the objects are in the open simulator itself. This conversion is internally in the uh, in the viewer itself. Ah, okay. Um, let's see here. Is there a way to map between the different platforms a standard of some sort and reference libraries? Well, that, that is difficult because uh, every uh, viewer has his own rendering engine. Um, but there are, of course, um, there are, of course, uh, uh, standards about uh, defining uh, graphical components. Uh, but to what extent that is followed by Open Simulator, I don't know, to be honest, because we focus on what there is and to convert it, not to change it on the open simulator side. Okay. And Gavin Hurd asks, is the, your target group for this development users with 3D headsets? No, it's one of the uh, one of the target groups. And what are the others? See people with normal TD, 2D uh, PCs and laptops. Okay. Because um, I think, and we, 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 we had this in, 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 in a lot of um, earlier uh, discussions, is that um, I don't think that uh, people will, I think that in a lot of cases, having a laptop or a screen 
is more effective for people than wearing a 3D headset. First of all, it's costly. People do not, eh? and, and, and a laptop or a PC you always have at home. Mm -hmm. A headset is the only thing you need for audio. And so not only the cost, but also I cannot imagine, uh, at least I would not like to wear a, a 3D headset the whole day long. Mm -hmm. So it's also the duration that you can use this headset, 3D headset is a is limited. You cannot ask people to to wear a headset for three hours or so. Yeah. Uh, so th it is it is a, a way uh, of getting better emerged into a virtual world, but the time you can do that is limited. Uh, and so I think it's not only 3D. It's also the normal PC, laptop, and 2D screens uh, that are important. Uh, so it's it's not targeted at only that group. It's targeted at all groups. Uh, Nick is asking, will there be a web viewer? That might be, but that's not um, our first. Uh, that's not on the on the on the roadmap now, because mm -hmm. we first want to transform the viewer and provide it with the flexibility that we need. Um, I, there is a way to do it with a, with a web viewer, and that's what what we said before, using uh, rendering in the cloud. But that's a, a costly solution. Uh, but you can do that now. Eh? You don't need to wait for uh, for some changes. You can do that already, but you need uh, certain work in uh, uh, running it in, in in servers, the rendering itself, and that's 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 quite a, that's quite expensive. So, um, but not for now. And, and there is also still the there is still the um, limitation in graphical capabilities that you have when you simply want to run a web viewer. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to ask, and I, uh, any intern that wants to to uh, comment on this, but I'm curious, you know, as you're working on this project, how is it inspiring you to think of the next project you want to work on? Anyone? Oscar? I don't know if you're uh, yeah, muted. Oh. Yeah, sure. I can uh, give an, an answer. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I've more or less always wanted to to work uh, on uh, projects like these, uh, um, making a 3D application games or just a simulator like these. So, uh, <laughs> for the future, yeah, if I could uh, continue doing uh, things like this. You know? Nice, nice. Go ahead, Frank. I'm sorry. Okay, Gavin Hurd has a question. Why is it that you think the M1 processor used in Apple's laptops and desktops running the current viewers perfectly fine are not able to run a viewer in a phone when the exact same processor is used? Ooh, well, it's not only the processor, of course, it's the graphical, uh, the GPU that's in the processor that has to support it. Yeah. And the CPU is GPU is maybe not enough. I don't know. We didn't we didn't really have any exp we didn't really have any experimentation on uh, on uh, on mobile phones because we are so far from having a, 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 a something that we can re run on a on a laptop or PC and then we can maybe see if we can uh, transfer it to the phone but to a to a mobile phone. But until now, um, all the articles I read is the limitation uh, in graphical capabilities for uh, for that. Nope. All right. Um, let me see if I have a last question here. Um, are you guys going to be at a booth after this? The people yes. ask questions. Yes, yeah, we. we'll be at the booth at the break. And where is your booth? We are booth number four in Expo Zone 3. All right. Booth number four, Expo Zone 3. Aha. Uh -huh. So if anybody else has further questions for them, um, please stop by there. And I want to thank, gosh, all of the interns here. What great project you're working on. Very exciting stuff to move us all into the future when you figure this stuff out. So we really look forward to your success. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you to all the interns that take the time to, uh, to be here to, today to explain it uh, to, uh, to the audience. All right.
Well, as a reminder to the audience, check out the website, conference.opensimulator.org, and see what's coming up on the conference schedule. Following this session, we do have a little break, and their next session will begin at 9.30 a.m. and is entitled Digital Citizenship for Cyborgs and Avatars. Yes, please. Anyhow, oh, I added the yes, please, because I can't wait to hear it. Anyhow, all right. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you at 9.30 a.m. Thanks, everyone, and thank you very much to the interns.